Scott is a journalist and campaigner and the author and I really hate the word of the heretics guy that's really it's a really difficult word for me. Heretics? Heretics. Heretics. Heret heretics. Guide to global finance, hacking the future of money. He works on financial reform, alternative finance and economic activism with a wide variety of NGOs, artists and students. And he's also a fellow of the Finance Innovation Lab in London and an associate of the ISB, of the Institute for Social Banking. And he published several papers and books, and his latest paper was awarded with an Essex and Trust and Finance Global Prize. And I think about this specific paper you, you are going to talk tonight, right? So I think this is a good moment to give the stage to you. Cool. Welcome, Brett. Cool. It's good to be back here. Last time I was here, when was that? 2015? No, 16. 16, something like that. I was talking about the politics and ethics of blockchain technology. And it was like a week before there was this like massive hack of one of the big um, blockchain technology startups or systems called Ethereum. And I seem to remember like critiquing all the language around Ethereum. So they had this whole thing about like, do, do you guys know Ethereum? Yeah. So they had this kind of like um, claim to be uh, driven by the, uh, the the steadfast will of unstoppable code. And the next week they got hacked. And they all decided to like change the code. And it was just like totally hilarious, hilarious thing. Um, so that was that's what I was talking about last time. But I actually know Seneca from the Institute for Social Banking, so I do some stuff around social banking sometimes, which is like alternative banking systems. Um, but no, just I wrote this, this book a few years ago, in 2013, it's a bit outdated now. It's uh, been pirated, so you can actually get PDF copies of it now, it doesn't get to actually buy the physical copies, but my uh, Twitter profile is that, and my email address is that, so if you want to get hold of me about anything, you can do so. Can you guys hear me all right? Um, I don't actually like work for any particular organization. I work for like loads of different groups, like briefly and sporadically and kind of go in and out. But, but the general thing I try to do is to hang around groups that are working on uh, alternative finance, so uh, sort of non-mainstream finance as it were, and financial activism, so campaigns around the financial sector. Um, so I work with uh, NGOs of various sorts, the Chartered Accountants Institute, I'm part of like various like alternative currencies. I also like teach some of these like tech tech places like Singularity University I've taught at, MIT Media Lab, I do some journalism. Anyway, the basic deal is I, I, I sort of like flit around between different types of or different types of groups who are have different assessments for what's wrong with the financial sector and what to do about it. And you get like vastly like different accounts of what's wrong and how you're going to sort of deal with it. Uh, for example, the blockchain technology community often has an extremely different account of what's wrong with the financial system to, for example, a local currency community. Um, as a matter of interest, uh, who of you are currently involved in like alternative finance or fintech? Okay, cool. So today, though. I'm going to talk about um, the financial technology sector. And there's this prize out there called the Ethics and Trust and Finance Prize. And it was actually, it used to be called the Robin Cosgrove Prize. And essentially it was a, an investment banker who died, um, who was very concerned about the ethics of the financial system. And when he died, his parents set up a trust in his name and started to fund the prize, asking financial professionals to think about the ethics of finance. And sort of write essays, and then each year they select a bunch of a bunch of winners. I actually was shortlisted for it like three years ago for this like kind of crazy paper I wrote on blockchain technology, which I like wrote like in a day and a half. Um, and they were kind of like into blockchain technology at this time, so I became I was sort of shortlisted for it. Um, and then this this last time I decided to write more about financial technology more generally, or, or sort of the original financial technology community, which is called fintech. Um, and the paper I produced was. Uh, called Hard Coding Ethics into Fintech. And the basic thing I was asking was, there's an existing body of ethics within the financial sector. 
And I actually, I used to work in the financial sector. Um, so there's an existing body of sort of ethical principles you find floating around in finance. Um, and the question I was thinking about was, what happens when you start to try to automate the financial sector? How does that impact that existing body of ethics and finance? Or what sort of new ethical issues uh, does it raise? Um, anyway, I got third prize, uh, which was just cool. Um, the guy, the guy, actually, the guy who won wrote about contactless payments card technology. Um, it was quite like a very specific paper on the uh, what he called libertarian paternalism, which is like nudge theory about how sort of banks were using that to get people to use contactless payments. Um, and it was a, a kind of like micro account of the sort of the politics of contactless payment technology. Um, but to kind of like frame this whole thing, I want to sort of like go back into finance more generally and then sort of think about how the automation process works and then how it impacts the ethics. Is that, that kind of clear enough? Cool. All right, like, whenever I'm thinking about finance, I always, I always start here, like, absolutely like everything in the entire world comes from ecological systems, right? Uh, so this is like the basis of like the, absolutely everything, like that camera there cannot exist without natural resources and humans applying themselves to these natural resources. So like I always like ground finance in this context. Um, and then like fast forward, if you want to look at like the basic components of an economic system, it's well, it's like a modern capitalist economic system, should we say? You have this sort of uh, this basic this is like a bit of a crap diagram, but like the, the idea is that with a normal capitalist production loop, is you you create inputs to production and outputs to production, right? And you use monetary exchange to mobilize those inputs. I mean, this might be very like straightforward and basic to people, but like I, I kind of like to sort of go over this again. Um, so we're using monetary exchange. So like like companies are mobilizing labor to pay people wages. They're mobilizing land or sort of resources um, on on land markets. They're paying for like technology on technology markets. Then they're like coordinating it, and then they output production onto consumer markets, or perhaps into sort of um, business to business markets. But this whole, whole, the whole system, the whole capitalist system as it were, is a series of monetary markets interlinked with each other at different scales. Okay. Um, now the question you always ask yourself is, how do you kickstart this process, right? To mobilize the inputs to production, you need money so that you can then uh, coordinate it all and output into markets, right? Um, and this is basically where the sort of the financial sector kind of plugs into the sort of corporate ecosystem. Um, so I've got this kind of turgid <laughs> slide about how I, how I see finance. Um, finance is basically, this is actually a really crude way of describing finance. Because um, this only describes like a part of the financial sector, but essentially the art of writing contracts um, that grants people rights to future money in exchange for giving present money, right? And you take that present money, you use it to mobilize the things in these markets here, and you basically you get the present money by promising people returns that come from this process down here, okay? Um, I don't know how clever that is, but you create these circuits. Um, and so finance is about creating these like monetary circuits that play out over time, okay? And then once you've created those instruments, you can kind of like detach them and like package them and move them around or trade them or whatever. But the basic idea is you're trying to like mobilize stuff um, through these, creating these financial instruments. Of course, a lot of modern finance is actually like the financing of finance um, or the financing of consumption of products that are built. But like in, in general, like the sort of like some kind of like basic finance concept is this. All right. Now, the thing about contracts, though, is that when we think about contracts, we're imagining somehow that... We often think about a contract as some kind of like mutual thing between two people, right? Like as, as if there's some kind of equality that's involved. Um, but modern financial contracts really don't have very much equality involved in them. Normally, we're obtaining these contracts from a huge scale organizations. Um, and I kind of like use this, this diagram here. Uh, some of you might have actually seen this in Frankfurt, if you've been to Frankfurt. This is the Commerce Bank Tower. So like if you stand outside of the Commerce Bank Tower, you see this like giant, like sort of megalithic structure. It's like Saruman's tower out of Lord of the Rings. This is a huge, this huge thing, right? Um, and you perceive this is how we have to perceive the financial sector. Right? We approach it 
these are huge scale organizations, and we see them as like bureaucracies that we have to learn how to interact with, all right? You have to like fill out the form to get the, get the loan. You have to like interact with the rules set by the financial institutions themselves. If you are within the financial institution though, you see the world in a very different way, right? So you're looking out of the building. Now this is actually the urinals that you find within Commerce Bank Tower. Um, so I always, I always love this picture. But basically, uh, you're dealing at such a large scale, the way that you see the world is through abstractions, all right? You're dealing with so many like small individual pieces that you, you really don't care about the individual clients that you're dealing with. You would rather basically find ways to uh, process them through spreadsheets or uh, use uh, big data methodologies to work out who they are. All right? And this is like a general characteristic of any scaled system or any bureaucratic system. You have to set up these standardized rule systems and standardized ways of processing large numbers of people. Um, now this represents a power dynamic um, between the people who are entering into the contracts and those who are actually often designing the contracts and sort of packaging and moving around. So this is, sorry, I don't, I don't normally like to use slides that have writing on them. Um, but the basic power dynamics of, of modern financial contracts is that you have these small scale uh, sort of individual people who are dealing with these huge institutions or else you have these institutions that are gathering the money of lots of small-scale investors to lend it or, or sort of create bonds or whatever for other large-scale institutions. You have this interaction between the sort of um, high finance of the world, sort of the Towers of Canary Wharf or Frankfurt, and then the everyday finance, which is a sort of small-scale finance of individual people. And they all kind of like sort of uh, coalesce into these huge financial structures. Um, and this has got a big power dynamic to it, right? You, uh, if you guys have been involved in hacker culture, like one of the big things in sort of hacking communities is the realization that like most of, in most of our lives we're dealing with huge scale bureaucracies and we never really get beyond the, um, we never actually know what's going on behind the sort of the interface of these bureaucracies and you want to try and get behind and see what's actually happening and sort of change that power dynamic, all right? Um, just to visually represent the, another way to put it, this is like a sort of a basic diagram of the, the UK banking system, and here are sort of individual people, and you have these huge banks who run these giant data centers, and then they're all linked up together at the central bank, and then we sort of like approach them and like ask them to sort of edit data for us, or sort of like, you know, um, quote unquote, move our money around, or, or so on. Uh, and this is the kind of like the, the basic sort of uh, the visual structure. And then a large part of what the financial technology industry is trying to do with this basic underlying structure is to sort of insert new layers between us and these financial institutions, okay? Um, so I'm going to kind of flick into this automation process. Um, I put out this tweet a little while back, which is kind of like a very cynical thing to say about the financial technology industry. Um, and I basically said, these companies specialize in making it easier to interact with a toxic system. All right? That's what they really are trying to do. Like, I'm, not, I'm not saying all financial technology companies try to do this, but in general, this is what fintech companies do. They don't really ever make a critique of the underlying system itself. All right? They just try to make it faster or more convenient or something like that. Right? Um, they don't necessarily have a problem with the underlying power dynamics of the structure. Um, well, I mean, you can debate that. I'm not saying all financial technology companies are like this, but in general, this is what's going on with fintech companies. Um, now, one of the things you're going to find if you're ever running a huge scale bureaucracy is you have an impulse to automate. Okay? You have an impulse to standardize and an impulse to process large numbers of individual people through it. And automation is one of the things you can use to make this, to streamline this process. Um, I personally think that. Yeah, not everyone agrees with me on this, but like a key component of corporate capitalism is that corporations always have a drive to automate. Right? They always are trying to essentially streamline processes, cut costs, and one of the key ways to do that is through automation processes. All right? So if you want to look at what's happening with the fintech industry, um, the best way to sort of describe it is the, it's the automation of the financial sector. All right? It's sort of individual components of automation of, of finance that are going on. Um, and what you basically want to do is you either want to automate the people who are inside the tower, all right? The financial professionals who offer you these contracts or like um, do all the kind of sort of background work, right? You, you either want to like turn them into robots, 
all right? Or else you want to automate the user experience of how you interact with those professionals. Okay, so sort of remove the sort of front office staff or remove all the kind of like people that you would ordinarily, the branches or the kind of like uh, various sort of layers of interaction. Um, and this, I mean, this, this doesn't cover every, every fintech startup in the world, but it covers a significant portion of them. If you go through like a fintech list and you look at what they're doing, a large, a large part of it could be fitted within somewhere in this, in this basic schema. Um, so I'm going to look at that one and look at that one, sort of the basic things that are going on. You guys like agree with this so far? Any immediate questions? Okay. All right, so let's look at FinTech layer one, the automation of financial professionals. And this will get into the ethics like pretty soon. All right. So if we, if we take seriously the idea that basically finance is the art of writing contracts, okay, about money. Now, in principle, you don't really need anything more than pen and paper to write contracts and the legal system to enforce it. Right? Like old school finance was pretty much this, you know, guys writing on quill pens and shit like that. And, um, and, and like, you do find like these kind of early like tools that financial professionals use, right? So like abacuses, and this is kind of like a technology, right? You're finding ways to essentially streamline and speed up the process of, of creating these contracts, calculating the terms and all that kind of thing, right? Um, so like tools to me are like a sort of first phase of any kind of like technological development process. Um, if you take a tool though and you apply uh, some kind of like non-human energy to it, it turns into a machine. <coughs> all right. So like the basic difference between like a tool and a machine is, at least in my like definition, is like a tool really relies on some kind of like human energy applied to it. So you think about like a like a spade, for example. Like you're actually using your bodily energy and you're transmitting it through a tool, all right? Whereas if you now add, for example, fossil fuel power to some kind of machine, you're actually not really using your bodily energy, you're now gonna use some external non-human energy source, all right? Like, for example, one of those, one of those things they use to like break open the ground, or whatever, the jet jackhammers, all right? Now, that's a good, good example of like the automation of a tool. It's like the automation of a pick, all right? So, Within finance, though, the question is like, what is like a financial machine, right? Um, I get to see like lots of financial machines. I think Excel spreadsheets, for example, are a financial machine. All right, like you can with an Excel. I mean, I used to work in finance where these like crazy like pricing models for like derivative contracts, which if a human was actually like manually calculating the stuff, it would take them like days, right, to actually go through all the stuff. You create an Excel spreadsheet. It can process through all the data. It can do that kind of quote unquote thinking for you. Um, in a much quicker time. So in a, in a sense, it's the automation of a, of a sort of human thinking process. Um, that's kind of like one, one way to put it. And this is like a, kind of like a loan pricing model of some sort, um, which I would see as some kind of like financial machine. Um, if you then want to think about like what you move on to from there, you move on to the realm of robots, right? So like robots to me is when you start to endow the endow these machines with some kind of decision-making capability, all right? So you say, you're gonna like process something, and then under certain conditions, you can actually make decisions, all right? Um, so for example, a, this, is, this here is like working out something about a loan, but imagine you, you created something that said, if, if the, the loan, um, if, if the data outputs certain, um, uh, certain scores, give the person a loan automatically, all right? So you could have, for example, a credit scoring model, which is just like a machine um, processing your credit score, but you could then add a sort of robotic component onto it saying, um, if the person achieves a certain credit score, automatically grant them a loan, all right? So you've kind of like created this, this machine that can make decisions. Um, so within the financial sector, there's this whole, this whole realm of these financial robots, as it were, uh, this is an example of, of this group called Wealthfront, which is an automated wealth, uh, wealth management company. Um, and basically they're sort of, uh, in, in the old days of wealth management, you would like approach a wealth manager, this is like basically if you're a really rich person, and you say, please would you give me advice on what to invest in, right? And these guys have, have created a system that automatically gives you advice depending on what information you, you give it. Um, so this is kind of like a financial, like a, like a robot advisor. So they call this like a robo-advisor. Um, do any of you guys actually use these platforms as a matter of interest? What do you use? I'm not using it. 
Do you use wealth breath? Is it good? Cool. But I mean, these robot processes are happening a lot in finance, like in many different areas. Um, interestingly, the thing people mostly think of when you say like robot finance is they imagine like algorithmic trading, like high frequency trading algorithms and stuff, which essentially are trading models given the power executive power to issue, to engage in trading. Um, I don't really think that's like the most important part of financial automation, but people tend to fixate upon high frequency trading and algorithmic trading as being like the sort of quintessential example of financial robots. Um, but at, at the sort of front lines of the stuff, we have, I guess, the world of AI. Um, is anybody involved in AI here? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't claim to be an expert in the dynamics of AI, the basic, the basic distinction going on here is a traditional robot essentially follows orders. All right? You basically tell it, under this condition, do this. Under this condition, do that. All right? It essentially follows a set pattern of orders. Uh, machine learning systems are creating robotic systems that have the ability to um, learn from past experience. Okay? So to sort of take the outcomes of previous inputs and learn like whether that, that was a a good suggestion to make. Um, so for example, you could have a credit scoring model that starts to um, uh, learn, from, learn from past, a, a traditional credit scoring model would be something like a bunch of humans watch what's happening in the world and then they start to work out various things. They, they, they come up with personal models about how credit scoring should work and then they, they codify it into an algorithm. Um, whereas these systems they basically set the systems out to go and find um, what a, a good credit score is. I'm not describing this very well. Um, but essentially it's this idea that you're going to calibrate these models, or you're going to create models that can self-calibrate and learn from past experience. Um, so that's the sort of frontier of financial automation, of, of financial professionals. Now the second sort of part of financial automation is when you're trying to automate the way that you interact with financial professionals. Okay, so like you can try to aut automate financial professionals themselves, but then you can try to like automate the interaction process. Okay, the sort of the as you're approaching the building as it were. Um, and the basic way you try to do this is to eliminate um, non-digital interaction options. Okay, so it basically entails removing branches, removing ATMs, removing anything that doesn't entail some kind of like interaction with some sort of interface. All right. Um, Interestingly, like within the fintech sector, you find a lot of sort of fixation upon like thousands of different new apps you can use. All right, but what you never find is a um, recognition of the fact that we're getting rid of all forms of interaction that don't involve apps. Okay, so actually, there's often like a reduction of choice going on in, in a certain sense, um, and then a sort of proliferation of options within this new sort of like uh, digital sphere. Um, and I actually do quite a lot of work around cashless society dynamics or the sort of the process of digitizing um, digital uh, or payment systems. And there's a lot of like uh, dangerous dynamics that are going on with, with cashless society. Uh, but essentially, what people are saying in, in that, that sphere is that we want to get rid of the ability to engage in payment without interacting with banks. Okay, that's the sort of the world of cashless society. Um, the other sort of section of this is you can add new layers on top of the financial sector. Okay, so if you guys have been involved in sort of the bank API world, it's essentially you can um, take the underlying bank structures and then sort of plug new things on top of them. Have any of you guys got like Monzo cards and that kind of thing where you sort of like can interact with financial institutions through your app, like a number of different financial institutions? Okay, well, basically it's this idea you know, you're going to sort of put new layers on top of the financial sector. Um, so, one of the sort of frontiers of this right now is stuff like chatbots. Um, so this is a this is Meet Clio, which is like a um, essentially a glorified interface. Okay, it's like a system that is going to uh, plug you into the financial system whilst pretending that it's a human. Okay, um, and, and the basic impulse of financial institutions right now is they're saying. 
We want to get rid of all non-digital interaction options, but we're concerned about the fact that people are going to lose human connection to finance in this process. So let's design interfaces that masquerade as being humans, all right? So we'll have some kind of like human interaction process, all right? So Meet Clear is an example of one of these sort of chatbots that uses natural language, language processing to um, essentially like pretend to be a human interacting with you. But essentially it's a glorified interface it's a, it's a bit like a menu, you know, like you, if, you, if you go to like a normal website, there's a sort of standard menu that's, that comes down. Um, Clio has one of these menus too, but it just sort of like presents it to you in a way that's, that's uh, as if it's a human interactive. Um, it's really, really hot. Are you guys really hot? <laughs> kind of like dehydrating, but totally. Uh, but whatever. Um, if you want to automate the sort of interaction layer of finance, though, you also have to basically automate the process by which people prove who they are. Okay, so one of the other sort of big um, uh, sort of fields going on around, right now in fintech is this biometrics, the realm of biometrics, right? So traditionally, if I walk into a bank branch, I'd have to sort of prove um, who I am by potentially, you know, handing my passport in or sort of proving I can, you know, push a certain pin code in. Um, but to streamline this process, things like biometrics are coming in as a way to sort of uh, enable you to authenticate yourself when you're about to communicate with financial institutions. Okay, now I want to sort of uh, speed up a bit because I want to get to the ethics section. The basic thing that's going on with the sort of second layer of fintech is the drive to replace service with self-service. Okay, if you think about how you cut costs in corporations, you want to uh, essentially get people to serve themselves. All right. Now a good example of this is the. Uh, uh, sort of supermarket self-checkout systems. I don't know if you guys have experienced these. But essentially, groups like, for example, Tesco in, in the UK put these self-service uh, systems in place and they initially present them as being new options for you. They say, okay, if you want to quickly get past, you know, not have to deal with the cashier, um, you, can use, you can use these systems here. But what they then subsequently do is they then use these as an, as an excuse to, or a justification for getting rid of the cashiers. All right, so they actually say, well, now there's this new option, we can actually fire the cashiers, uh, with at least some of them. Of course, in doing that, they then make it harder to interact with the cashiers or more in inconvenient to do so. Now it takes long, longer to do it. So it actually then pushes you more towards these type of self-service options, right? So they slowly like engineer the environment. Um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> engineer the environment such that you like slowly move towards these systems. Okay, and banks right now are doing that, right? They're slowly but surely trying to engineer the environment such that you slowly like, stop using the non-digital interaction options. I've been with design firms in London who... Uh, I've, been, I've been with... This, this, do you want to fish it? Yeah, sure. I have a comment, but okay. I, I saw one of these like, the other day with the past Say again? I saw one of these like, the other day with the past and it's workshop Yeah. And I mean... First of all, they have a combination of both. That's what I noticed. Yeah. And when they had meat, like, and those, like, all the ones, they actually had, like, people supervising them. Yeah, yeah. So it's not that they get rid of them. But the, the end goal or the trajectory is to slowly, like, move you towards that, right? So like right now they, they, they don't work half the time, right? But the, the, the end objective is like slowly wean people off the non-digital interaction options or the, or the non-automated interaction options, okay? So these, these design firms I've, I've been, I was in London, they get explicit briefs from banks saying, um, find ways to stop people using the branches. Find ways to make old, older people use digital. Because in the end, in the long term, the banks cut costs like this, right? So that's their agenda. In the meantime, they'll present these things as being like cool new options, that are the that's going to be fun and so on. But like they basically want to get rid of anything that's not digital, okay, in the long term. Um, so, you know, Amazon already has five stores where you don't need to check out and you don't need any patients like this in the school. They took their items and leave. Yeah, sure. So, so uh, media is so what? Uh, I missed the, uh, is it the bad thing? Is it not like uh, it was popping commentary that it's not good or is... No, no, I'm just sort of, I'm just like uh, highlighting a process that's occurring in many, indus many industries. Okay. Um, just as a matter of interest, if you look back in banks um, in, the, in the past, this comes from like Barclays in the, in like the, nine, like the 19, early 1960s, I think. They had this whole thing that said, like, we'll never put any robots at the counter, right? 
what they're saying this year is like, like we will use like mechanical aids in the back rooms, okay, essentially about you know uh, the automation of financial professionals or the, the use of um, computers in the sort of like the back offices, but we'll never have this out in the front. Now that now Barclays is one of the sort of leading groups trying to basically push these onto the front lines, okay, it's like you're going to interact with your app. You're not going to interact with one of our staff members. Okay, so this is you'll see why this plays into the ethics question uh, pretty quickly. Um, so the basic the basic thing that's going on, at least in the sort of the, the general trajectory that's occurring, is like this is like your old model. Like you walk in, you have some kind of human in interaction. There's some guy who like tries to make a decision about whether to grant you a loan or not. This is some sort of ideal you know ideal set. Some like old school banking, right? You want to like replace this with. You, you remove this person, replace them with some kind of algorithmic system, and then you make the interaction option an app. Okay, so you input your data via one of these apps, it then processes itself through some kind of machine learning system, just makes a decision for you, and then outputs a decision. And this is, this is the whole process, right? Um, and the sort of front, actually, the, some of the frontiers of, of this are actually when you yourself don't even have to input the data. Okay, your devices start to do it automatically for you. Um, so I was actually in Singapore at this uh, conference with these guys, the Media Foundation, and one of their big things they're very excited about is the fact that they can use the location data on phones to essentially like work out credit scores. So this is an example of a person. If you think about your old credit scoring system, you, you might have you might have had people like you know sort of like watching certain elements of you, but you might have sort of like gone to a sort of a, a loan officer and sort of made a case for something. You, in, in a sense, you're manually inputting the data. You're like you're like giving over stuff. In this system, it's just like watching what you're doing. Like you're not inputting the data, this device is doing it for you. All right? And then they're like watching your movement patterns, and from these movement patterns, trying to infer how, how good your, your, your credit worthiness is. It goes actually beyond that. It goes further than that. Not, they're not just calculating on their own, the, the credit score, and basically the geolocation data. They also push the loan to you. I mean, you have massive pocket of your phone. So All right, yeah, sure. Right. Loan, as a, if you want to make it possible, you want to have to be masked for it. Yeah, yeah. No, for sure. I mean, yeah. And we can debate whether you think this is a good thing or not, all right? But, like, this is, in general, the, the push. Um, <laughs> this is also happening, for example, in, in, like, fund management. If you want to engage in investment, you can now... You know, in some old process, you might have like manually approached some financial advisor, and he would have been inputted some kind of like request or some broker for you to buy stuff. I mean, I don't know all the different processes, but like in these new systems, you input your data into some kind of app, and then maybe it's going to something like Wealthfront, and it's making decisions for you. So you have this like whole this all round automation process. Okay, now having like sort of made that basic argument about the sort of general trajectory in finance. Um, the question you then want to ask is like, how does this impact financial ethics? Okay, um, I don't have time to go into like the entire like depths of all financial ethics, but I'm going to try and like look at some kind of key components. Um, when we're talking about like financial ethics in the retail finance sector, so like basically you know your everyday person, these are sort of like three key areas I sort of sketched out about sort of like um, scandals you see in the press or sort of like questions about ethics. So one of them is around like how your retail borrowers um, are treated. Okay. Um, so for example, during the financial crisis, there's this question about you know where people can be given predatory loans, um, payday lenders. There's also a question about like the power dynamics of giving people or getting people into debt. Okay. So how are, how are retail borrowers treated? And then on the other side of the of a bank's balance sheet, um, how are retail depositors, investors, and investors treated? Or like you know. Um, so like bank depositors or some investors and funds and so on, like are they being screwed over by the banks? Are they getting less than what they should? Are the fees too high? Are they being manipulated and so on? Um, but then there's a whole another realm of, of ethics, which is um, what do these big financial institutions actually um, go and finance? Um, what do they lend to, or what do they sort of uh, 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 what financial instruments do they buy using retail investors' money? Okay. So this is often the realm of ethical finance, or the realm of, sort of ethical funds and so on. Um, I'm going to sort of focus on, on this question. Um, and just to go back to that, that early picture I had, um, if you're looking at a financial investor is going to plug themselves into this process yeah, in some kind of way, either by like lending or by sort of 
uh, giving equity or sort of whatever it is, like financial investors are plugging themselves into these corporate production loops. If you think about the rest, like ethics of this process of any kind of corporate production loop, you have a number of different areas. You've got like, how well are your workers treated? It's so like labor relations. Are these companies exploiting workers, okay? Um, are they screwing up like the land or the environment or like creating environmental destruction? Um, is there like fraud going on? Are people who are buying the products being screwed over in various kind of ways? Okay, so like, are you, are you being sold toxic products? And these are all kind of like various sort of like ethical questions that come into any sort of production cycle. Um, and anybody who is essentially kickstarting this process through providing financing, in some senses, is implicated in any of those particular things. So a lot of ethical finance movements will say, like divestment movements, are always basically trying to make this argument saying, um, if a company is doing something shit, and you are one of the investors or one of the financiers, you should take some kind of ethical responsibility for this, or you should be implicated in this, and you should like not sort of pretend that you're not implicated in this process. Okay. Um, but the financial sector has a range of like interesting ways to neutralize this argument. Okay. Um, and one of the key ways that they do it is to point to the ethical financial sector. Uh, I'll try to make this argument. Um, like, and I used to work in finance, so I kind of like experienced this, this mentality happening like quite a lot. So like, what these guys will often do into the mainstream finance is to say, if you want to bring your ethics into finance, go to the ethical financial sector. All right? Like, what we do is apolitical, amoral, rational investment. And if you feel like bringing ethics in, go to these types of funds here. They offer you, that's where you can bring your ethics in. Okay? Um, I don't know if you guys have agreed with this or have experienced this kind of like narrative around ethical finance, but this is how often they do it. They say, that's where ethics is, this is where science is, or this is where like rational investment is, okay? Um, and it's, it's deeply problematic on many accounts, all right? So like the first thing, and I'm going to try to like skirt over this, but I probably don't have very much time there. Um, the first thing is, within so-called rational finance, you know, this kind of like sort of scientific rational finance are many embedded ethical principles that are simply taken for granted. All right. So, for example, um, financing slave labor. All right. Back in the 18th century, it was actually totally like fine to finance slave labor, and it was part of what was called rational finance. It's part of how you like think about finance. So it's like this is like, within the realm of normality. All right. Slave labor was actually like squeezed out of the concept of rational finance through a bunch of like people who, who campaigned against it and took it out of the realm of those types of calculations, saying like this is not a legitimate activity that you can talk about within normal finance. All right. Um, so in a sense, normal finance right now, the so-called like you know apolitical rational finance, um, has all these kind of like embedded things that they they are actually implicitly sort of ethical positions. Right. The second thing is. Um, indifference is an ethical position. Okay, so as soon as, these, as soon as like financiers claim that uh, part, part, of the, part of the dynamic of ethical finance, or this term ethical finance, is the idea that you're only acting with ethics when you have like an overt concern, right? When you're overtly going and actually like acting on your ethics, right? Whereas if you're just like indifferent and not doing anything, that's not an ethical position, all right? So standard rational finance is essentially like indifference to this, to, to many of these types of things. But that is an ethical position, right? That's a, that's a, that's a particular moral stance you're taking, right? So you're not in, the, in some kind of apolitical, amoral realm when you say, well, I don't, I don't have an opinion, okay? Um, one of the sort of key like um, ethical uh, paradigms you find in finance is what's called, mon well, I call it monetary egoism, okay? So like, Within sort of ethical theory, there's this concept of what's called ethical egoism, which is an ethical position, um, which says something is correct if it's in your self-interest, essentially. Okay? Something is right, or something is moral, if it's in your self-interest. Okay? Um, it's kind of like a variant of utilitarianism. So like with the utilitarianism, it's like something is right if it's in the collective, if like collectively it does more good than harm. Okay. Whereas this ethical egoism like narrows that utilitarianism right down and says, if you get more out of this than you lose, then it's right. Okay. Um, within finance, it, it narrows it down to like money. So you say, if this thing 
earns a certain return, it's correct, all right? Um, and you can, this is often like, encapsulated mathematically in the sort of risk-return calculations of finance, all right? Which says um, a good investment is something that has um, a high return relative to the amount of risk you put into it, right? And that's how you sort of like calculate your ethical egoist position. Um, the other concept that's attached to this is like, that's what's called the, the externalities. Um, so externalities are the sort of the social consequences of your personal egoistic actions, okay? So, I don't know if this, this diagram really like this describes the whole thing, um, but when you're engaging in your personal pursuit of interest and you fuck up a whole bunch of other stuff for other people, with an ethical egoist consideration, that's not considered important, all right? It's like, well, I'm acting in my interest, I, I don't have to think about the collective interest. And in economics, this gets referred to as externalities, all right? And economics, well, the key way that they try to reconcile this is to then make these externalities sort of bring them into ethical egoist um, calculations. So put a cost to uh, environmental destruction for the individual. So they start to then incorporate these um, principles into their sort of egoistic um, position. I don't know if this is entirely clear. I'm sort of like, I'm tired, but like, how are you guys getting it? Yeah? Are you getting to the evaluation eventually? Or because to me at the moment, there seems to be a judgment in it. But I can't get it clearly. Okay. Um, I'm going to be very curious about what your evaluation or what, whatever you want to call it is in the end. Yeah, I'm, I'm working towards it. It was, it was yeah. like a 5,000 word paper, so it's like. No, yeah, that's fine. Um, if you're working to it. Okay, so, so that, uh, yeah. well, how much time do I have left? Yeah. It's very interesting what you say. Okay, let me do like. I'm going to like, have to fly through this. I think the whole is too long. Okay, but anyway, there's a bunch of other these, like, justification strategies that go on in finance for how you deny that. Why, like a financial process, um, why financiers should be ethically responsible for the types of actions they engage in. All right, you have like denying personal agency is a kind of classic one, like I had no choice, this is my job, like it's the markets, we're just responding to the markets. You have this like, I'm acting on behalf, behalf of other people, it's not really my responsibility. Uh, denying causal responsibility, like it's not really like me alone who's doing this, there's many other people involved in this activity. Um, Appealing to collectives, yeah, so many other people are doing it. Asserting inevitability, this kind of idea of like, if I didn't do it, somebody else would, and therefore, like, it's not really me, right? Like, it would happen anywhere, so like, I don't have any personal responsibility. Um, so there's always kind of things you find in the, you'll, if, for example, if you, like, if you look at the financial crisis, like responses to this, you find a lot of this kind of stuff going on. But financiers are basically saying, we're not denying that something like bad happened, but we have justifications that make it all right, right? Now, what you might want to say, like, you don't, you don't have to agree with, like, what my assessment here, but, like, if we were trying to argue that um, how to create a sort of more overtly ethical financial system or a financial system that was less prone to poor ethics, you would want to find ways to break down people's ability to resort to these justification strategies, okay? Um, so you'd want to basically create, um, well, this is, the, this is the argument I was making, is you want to create moments for ethical pause within finance, all right? Um, so you want to create greater ethical reflection from financial professionals prior to making their decisions. You also want to connect them more closely to the ethical outcomes of their decisions, okay? Um, you also want to encourage customers, people sort of outside, who are interacting with these guys, to take a more active and demanding stance on ethics, all right? And then you also want to encourage customers to, to understand what's happening behind the scenes um, with their money. Now, part of my, my argument is financial technology or the automation of finance doesn't necessarily do this. And actually, potentially, it acts against all these things here. All right? Now, in the paper, I didn't actually say this was a definitive thing. What I, what I was saying is like, we need, we, we need to actually start to like study what the potential implications of automating the financial system is on these things here. Um, and I, I sort of I raised uh, five different research projects that I thought were important for us to think about going forward if we want to make sure that the, the, the fintech sector doesn't lead to worse outcomes in the financial sector. So the first one was, um, does automation reduce the ethical uh, awareness and responsibility of financial professionals? All right, the basic idea is like, as soon as you defer more and more tasks to machine-like systems, does it increasingly give financial professionals more and more justification strategies for why certain things have occurred. 
kind of sort of like point to models and point to machines. Even during the financial crisis has happened, right? People will always talk about the models. Like, well, the model said this. Like, as if the model had moral agency. As if the, mo the model was like the thing that was making the decisions. All right? So this whole like, uh, pointing to this sort of third party actor, this third party non-human actor as a justification strategy for your personal decisions. Um, so this is like, I think, a big open question. Like, what will actually happen to financial sector ethics when more and more stuff gets, gets automated? Um, will it get more and more kind of like, sort of like, detached? Um, a second big question I want to raise is, um, does automation reduce customer awareness of investment ethics? Now, I've worked on, on uh, sort of like, uh, awareness campaigns around banking, like activist campaigns, trying to get people to sort of demand more from banks, to sort of think about what the banks are doing, what they're financing. Um, and part of this process is actually getting people to stop and actually like think about what's going on. All right, so actually sort of put more sort of like uh, personal energy into it. But a large part of what the fintech sector is trying to do is to sort of reduce this, these moments of pause and reduce this friction and make you think even less about what you're actually investing in, right? So like, um, nutmeg uh, is a sort of London-based fintech group, and they they always have this, this phrase, like, just nutmeg it, which is just like, stop thinking about your finances, just just like nutmeg it, right? Just like, so just, like, like make it like sort of automated, and it'll happen somewhere else, you, you don't have to think about it, all right? Now that's, that's very clearly a position which is saying, it's not up to you to think about any of the stuff that you, that you are helping to finance, okay? Um, and that's a, 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 a question um, which I think is very important. Another very important question, um, does automation reduce accountability to retail borrowers? Now, so in a world where you start to increasingly um, outsource decision-making capabilities to uh, systems that have this kind of like machine learning capabilities or AI capabilities, um, you start to find the specter looming that the financial professionals themselves might not actually know why or not, not be able to easily account for why these systems have made the decisions that they have. Now, for certain types of financial products, this is very crucial because um, your inability to get credit is something that really can damage your life prospects, all right? And you actually, in these situations, should be able to demand some kind of accountability, like why have you excluded me from the system? Um, if financial professionals cannot do this, you have a real problem of accountability. Interestingly, I was, I was at this um, financial crime conference with, and the Dutch Central Bank was talking about this with, when it comes to sort of looking at like fraud detection. Um, one of the reasons why the Dutch Central Bank doesn't want to use AI systems for detecting fraud among various um, payments providers is that they can't account for why the system makes decisions and therefore cannot provide any accountability when the guys say, why have you excluded me from the market? Why have you taken my license away? Why have you, why have you accused me of these things? Um, so they're actually steering clear of this, this, very, this very reason. Um, the other big question, um, does automation lead to financial surveillance, all right? As you increasingly force people into um, increasing di digitized automation or, uh, interaction options, do you essentially start to like shoehorn them into systems that are gonna um, spy on them more and more? Um, I do a lot of work around this, this question. I'm not gonna go into it deeply right now, um, but it's of uh, significant concern. And people, when they're thinking about this, this question around uh, sort of surveillance, they're often imagining that the, the real issue at play is like, you know, some kind of like big brother state, like watching what they're doing. But the biggest, uh, the people who are pushing this the most are often financial institutions themselves, um, or, or various companies. And the reason that they want the data, the reason that they want to surveil you is they can use it to essentially influence you, okay, or to sort of create paths for you. Um, um, there's like various data activists, actually like Berlin is a big hub for data activism. Um, and, and one of the concerns is around these like panopticon effects that start to occur. Like once you suddenly have to become aware of that these various like watchers who are monitoring what you're doing, trying to influence you in various ways, you start to like feel it, right? You start to like feel that you're, there are various watchers around you all the time. And then the question is, how does this impact your inner state? Like, how does this impact your behavior? Does it have, like, these feedback loops? Like, think about credit scoring, for example. Um, in the past, like, old-school credit scoring models were, like, very blunt. It's just, like, you know, one, like, data point here, like, where you live. Like, one data point here. It's like, quite, like, crude, sort of, like, blunt data points. Now, imagine you make a system that's, that's looking at all parts of your life. It's looking at, like, how you move. It's looking at, like, your social media. It's looking at all these different things. And you become aware of that. 
you start to perceive that your every action might have some implication for your ability to access credit, for example. And this is where this like panopticon sort of like sort of what they uh, a social cooling effect, where it's just like shit. I have to like think about everything now because it might like, come and bite me or create create this kind of like. Um, uh, and, and then the, the real question is like if these systems of um, if this data is being plugged into incompetent mm -hmm. systems, you start to get Kafkaesque kind of like. Have you guys read Kafka? Mm -hmm. It's just like where the system like doesn't really know what it's doing and, and it's like making like incompetent decisions, but you don't really know. Like you can't really get any accountability for why this is happening. Um, so you might have all these like weird reactions. People trying to game the systems, trying to like do weird behaviors that they think will make the system think that they're a, a, a good player or, or so on. Um, so it's a, it's a really like, deep question. And then the last question, I'm probably going to just glance over this because it's a bit more abstract. Um, does automation reduce customer autonomy? Now this is like, like a sort of a far future looking kind of thing, which is like, um, I use this like menu as a sort of analogy for this, which is, if you walk into a restaurant, okay, there's like a menu. Now a menu is like essentially something that lays out your options. It delineates like what the choices are. All right, but it also tells you that what, like it also like like prevents certain choices. It says like you can have this, this, and this, and this here, but like you can can't. Have this right. Yeah, so exactly. So like it's, it's it's also like it's, it's it's like it screens out a bunch of stuff out of your imagination. Okay. Now, what a traditional like waiter does is essentially like mediates between you and this menu, and you say, yeah, can I actually you kind of like alter that and do this kind of thing? Yeah. And then if the, if the wait is like sympathetic, they can actually like almost like override the system. They can override the interaction options, and they can so they can be like human with you, right? Um, as you increasingly get rid of that sort of like waiter function, that sort of intermediary function out of, out of these, and you replace everything with essentially automated menu systems, an interesting question looms, which is you're now directly plugged into the sort of like the management structures of financial corporations without the intermediary layers. Um, and the management is much further away from you than, say, a frontline person is, are they really going to give a shit about what your personal preferences are? Um, or essentially, will these menus essentially start to like, like uh, delimit increasingly what you can actually do, especially if banks start to all come onto the, uh, start to use exactly the sort of same, um, come to the sort of same decisions about what's a profitable business model? Um, and that's a kind of a, an abstract question in a sense, and I'm not sure like, policymakers can do anything about it, but I think we should be thinking about this um, and I'm going to end there with those sort of reflections, and I guess these are sort of like designed to make, make people think, like, if you are designing these systems, how are you going to incorporate this, this type of thinking into it, um, or is there a way to essentially, like, uh, I know, Seneca, you were trying to, like, make these sort of, um, uh, kind of, like, sets of principles, people who are thinking about designing these, um, and is there some kind of like collective response that the fintech industry could come up with to um, prevent any of these bad outcomes from occurring? Um, so I'm a bit like tired tonight, and so like, I don't know how entirely clear that was, but like hopefully you got the basic point. Um, questions, comments? Blockchain. I could talk about blockchain as well. It's a whole other. It's a whole other. Like load of stuff. Please now. Should we use the mic for you and the audience? Because otherwise, it might be hard to understand. Can you hear me? Thanks. Um, I found this was very interesting and certainly not easy to disagree with. But I think it's very one-sided in a way. Like taking the last argument about the waiter, for example, would completely take out of the equation at that moment times. The way you try to sell you something that you actually don't want. Yeah, yeah. Right? And, and the whole mis selling scandals that happen in banking is kind of completely that. You've got yeah. people who actually want to sell an insurance product, but despite the fact you actually don't need it, and PPI in the UK have yeah. just for that reason. So the waiter is stuffing something down your throat that you never wanted, and kind of how do you counterbalance one versus the other? Yeah, sure. I, I should be clear that I actually wrote this paper specifically to highlight the negative potentials. So it, it, it wasn't actually saying this will happen, um, and it, I wasn't like, it was more like, how are you going to prevent those, those type of negative outcomes from occurring in the financial technology sector? And, and the reason was, is like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of like, um, papers out there, a description of how fintech can be used for like many good things, right? Or like improving outcomes of various sorts, and there's like tons of that, but there's very little written about 
the potential negative implications. But you're totally right. Like the, the, one of the big like, questions with, which is going on with like AI right now is around bias embedded into AI systems, right? Um, so if you're training these systems on past data, they can start to like replicate bigotry and so on. But on the other hand, like I'm from South Africa. Um, there were, for example, like white bank managers in South Africa who would like systematically exclude uh, black people from getting loans. All right, or so, like be like systematically like biased against them. So it's not like I don't want to like romanticize the sort of the human the human interface as it as it were. Um, but yeah, I think it's like a, a question that just needs to be raised and thought about. And ideally, like I mean, fine if these systems actually do produce better outcomes of some sort, then potentially that's um, important. I am very. I'm working for a mobile operator and the focus I'm uh, you described the eighty percent fit completely to our business tool. It's automation, it's about uh, importing the importing the, the interface to the customer, it's about uh, manipulating the people and, and things like this. So what it's uh, what I was expecting is a touch and go to cause of the problems which are maybe in the, in the financial system as such, it's about ownership, it's about the distribution of uh, ownership of control, it's about extraction. Uh, so if we want to change this system, there are two ways. Either we go to the democratic way, by the government, uh, by uh, building rules which impose uh, other behavior on financial system, and the other way is going to technology and building some other solutions which uh, have some demolish, some automatic value distribution within communities which have uh, multi-dimensional currencies which consider externalities. Yeah. So, um, probably you, you thought about this also, uh, how to change the, the problem of finance. Actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just bear in mind, I mean, I do a lot of work on finance more generally. All right. So this was. The, I, I think the question I was thinking about chair was like, how specifically does it's like fintech doesn't necessarily change like the underlying dynamics of like, um, you know, many like basic components of finance, but like it, it, it changes the sort of like experience of interacting with it, and it changes the sort of like the to me like the, the potentially changes like the sort of the ethical structure in certain ways, um, but like reforming finance itself is a much bigger question than fintech alone, right? Um, there was actually a story that came out, I guess, probably like post-financial crisis, which was this idea that, like, because at that time, like, tech had this kind of sort of warm glow around it, like Silicon Valley, right? And there's this whole idea that, like, like big bad finance would be, like, saved by, like, the white knight of technology. So original fintech startups all had this story, which is, like, we're coming to, like, democratize the financial sector, or we're coming to, like, sort it out. Um, now, interestingly, like, the tech sector is getting more and more kind of, like, dark clouds over it. I mean, like, you just walk through Berlin and you'll see, like, tons of people, like, um, you know, all these, like, things about Google, like, people not wanting Google to come here. There's a lot of, like, negative um, uh, sentiment coming towards tech. Um, the, and I, I'm, the, I'm kind of, like, skirting around your question, but, like, the original claim of, of the fintech industry around why it would reform finance was to, what was called, like, democratization of finance, which is essentially, like, we will lower the costs of providing financial services such that it's more profitable for banks to offer them to a wider range of people. It's one of the reasons why banks won't offer financial services to certain people is that it's just not profitable enough. Right? So if you can use technology to lower the costs, then the, the number of people you can serve gets wider. Um, and that was often the biggest sort of like generic claim of the fintech sector is that we can lower those costs and therefore people who were previously ex excluded from finance um, can get access. So that's within the realm of what's called like financial inclusion, right? Um, FinTech never claimed to sort of, uh, I don't know, fundamentally reform like the power structure of like the banking sector necessarily or like the many other things, but like that was the biggest kind of thing. Um, and I've kind of been skirting around the question. Did I, did I, did I sort of, yeah. but, but the financial reform more generally involves huge political campaigns and involves like all sorts of stuff, like building alternatives, and like within the within the building alternatives field, tech does play a part, right? So like there are people who are using tech as the basis for building like alternative structures, yeah. all right? But like mainstream fintech isn't really often doing that. Even like mainstream blockchain now isn't even doing that anymore, all right? Like old school blockchain kind of did that, um, but increasingly not really. 
Uh, so there's a, um, yeah, and I'm not, I'm not saying like FinTech doesn't have like these good potentials, but like I don't think it's the, it's a, the financial reform involves a lot more than that. And this, by the way, exactly the reason why we try to collect all these conscious FinTech people together here in Berlin in order to find the ones who are really implementing values first and then profit uh, and not the other way around. Uh, so if you know any fintechs which are trying to implement values and try to build impact, social impact in the world, then yeah. try to connect them to us and, and we will and uh, do our best to connect them all. It's also worth bearing in mind that like this this paradigm of like values first finance is like one of the paradigms of alternative finance. Like there's there's other paradigms too around how you like improve things. So like you get like for example like the anarchist traditions, which are just like you know, build completely autonomous structures that don't exist. Like you know, so like don't try to like change the sort of values of an existing system. Build different ownership structures, different things like somewhere else. Or like um, there's also like within finance one of the uh, Another sort of reform paradigm is around the scale or like the localization. So like for example, like the local banking movements. Um, they don't just make a critique around ethics. Um, they just basically say change like the um, area or the sort of like geographic scale that the organizations operate in and that will improve the outcomes. Um, so there's like, it's kind of like different sort of paradigms people thinking about like um, blockchain has a whole bunch of other like dynamics like what, what sort of like the ethical paradigm there is. Um, any more questions? Do we have time? I'm still trying to sort through all that you presented because I think there's a really great value in it. Um, you can also read the paper if you want. I'm quite so interested in actually because one of my interests is ethics in, in finance, but ethics and power, money and power and yeah. consciousness in business, mindful leadership and that kind of stuff. Um, let me try to maybe plug in, a, in, a, in a various points. And it's, I think it's a bit more for a comment or starting a dialogue than questions. Um, I have been working in, in banking since '99. I was actually working at Commerce Bank. Mm -hmm. Did you use the urinals? No, I didn't. <laughs> um, but I was up on those floors. I heard that story and I heard it in different ways told. And one of the things is that even the, the um, Forstand, the managing directors I worked with of Commerce Bank, on a human level, he was very human, one of those that, that, that I had contact with at that time, um, and trying to, to do good things, leading that bank. Yeah. Yeah? And not trying to look down on other people, but trying really to, to make the bank work and to do good things. I recently talked to um, the, the person in HR that hired me back then, or that convinced me to, to join Commons Bank back then in 99. And he said he was disappointed because of the way Commons Bank took now. Mm. I kind of can, can see that, why, though I'm not working in that bank anymore. But my, my comment is that in banking and the financial industry, I see a lot of people who try to go, do good and try to help and try to improve. Yeah. yeah. But they don't manage and the question is why don't they manage? Which brings me back to how can we how can we help people evolve to a different state, to a more ethical state and um, actually to to a high level of inner ethics. And I think what you point out pointing out and it's a bit of my understanding is that we can use tech to either support that or Adversary to to decrease that movement into higher ethics. Sure, yeah. Like Facebook can help people co connect to each other in a way, but it can also increase polarization. Yeah. Big big ways. Ah, what it does depends on the people using it. Yeah. And, but also on hard coding ethics, I was so interested in this. The other thing I wanted to point out um, is coding is about abstraction, is about um, exclusion, negating, because it is using some kind of language. Whenever we, we use language, we use concept, we are not directly in contact with the other person. Looking at you, your man, there is a woman and so on, and automatically I impose things. And that happens with coding. As you are so everybody can change it. Just as you can. Yeah, well, I, I just, um... So the, the problem about 
I, and I, like, I've been, I've been talking about like ethics here, right? Like, and, and, I, and I made like an appeal saying like, we could improve financial sector ethics by like encouraging this. But like, I don't necessarily believe that, all right? So like, I'm putting it out as a sort of like thing we should try to do. But I also have like a structural critique of like economic systems, which is often like meta, all right? Like large scale institutions, large scale corporate systems are by default, um, well not always, but like have like highly bureaucratic elements to them, all right? Like and I, I guess like once a certain culture gets locked into that institution, and sort of like codified into that institution, and once certain ways of operating get codified, if you want to like change it, you essentially have to like push pause on the institution, all right? And somehow like stop it, like reorganize it, and then like let it go again. But in reality, it's impossible to do. You can never push pause on an institution. It's always going to keep on like replicating itself and like carry on going over time, right? So like these, you know, I've seen like ethics consultants going into banks trying to sort of like, you know, talk to like bankers about like, oh, you should be more ethical. But it often feels extremely futile to me, right? It's like it's like kind of a very like surface level type of thing that's going on. It's not like a deep structural attempt to actually change something. Um, and one of the sort of like the things about, about this is why I think like the scale is important. The scale and sort of bureaucratic structure is important because within these these systems, even if you have people who want to do things better, the system itself doesn't necessarily allow them to do it. All right. You actually have many people in banking who are extremely ethical, but who still will produce bad outcomes, all right, because of the sort of the structure and the scale of the organization. Um, and they have all these like fragmented hierarchies, so you can like, nobody, people are like sort of like distributing blame around the place. You have like, fr like abstraction of everything, so like you, everything that you're doing is like so far away from you. So you have all these kind of like structures in place that the, the scale of the institution facilitates. So like the real question is, like, given that that's the structure of the global economy, like, like, can you improve the ethics or not? I mean, I, I don't know. I, 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 I give some so good questions. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, um, that leads to a segue to my question, which was you talked a lot about the finance sector. But the point is, uh, I think fundamentally it is an abstraction or representation of ethics of society as a whole. So, and so hoping we you know, keep trying to do nice things, but they leak tons of oil into the Gulf and don't care for for matter purposes. So the point is, it's uh, essentially this thing of, hey, there might be a problem with automate things. I would say it's actually good riddance because we would be automating things so we actually make it more crystal clear on what decisions are they making and how. Because as someone who works on these you know, AI systems in and out, they're far more dependable in many, many ways than human beings. Uh, that being said, uh, you're in any well, way, Provided that you are dependable. You know, in fact, as the designer. The designer, yes. Uh, and having one point of responsibility is easier than having a system of responsibility when no one's responsible. Uh, like there's an anthropologist David Graber who yeah. talks about the phenomenon of bullshit jobs and a lot of these finance jobs are what you would classify as bullshit jobs. So the point is to automate them away, I don't see is uh, in and of itself a bad thing. I think, mean, yeah, so... Yeah, if, if, yeah. If, you're, if you do a full analysis though of all the, the cycles of, of an economy, so like, yeah, sure, on, on some kind of like, if, if you isolate the question like that, then fine. So like David Graeber, bullshit jobs, therefore get rid of them. It's like, well, it doesn't quite work like that, actually. Like, you, you couldn't create a whole bunch of feedbacks if you do that, actually. Sure, so. and the problem with those feedback loops is because of the, the scale and the structural uh, organization of these big uh, uh, yeah, companies. And ultimately, you sort of build up this mess and you have only a couple of ways to solve it. Mm -hmm. And even, for example, with Bitcoin and blockchain, which were originally uh, designed to be a crypto anarchist, so you want to get or reduce the impact of human beings and geopolitical uh, um, you know, structures on the price of money. But essentially, it was revealed uh, by some researchers that the price of bitcoins was insanely manipulated by one of the essential. Ah, uh, sure, yeah. I mean, 
I mean, you should not remain suspect and remember. I see. Yeah. Exactly. I see five more questions over there. Two, three, four, five. Okay? And keep it short and simple, okay? That would be fantastic. Okay. You briefly touched up on the point of intentionality earlier on, and I'd be curious to hear more more thoughts on, on the issue of intentionality in, in fintech. It doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter as long as the outcome is positive. You mentioned the sector of financial inclusion, more access, lower prices. Doesn't intentionality matter? Intentionality as in like what? What do you mean? As in intentionally being ethical as, as a fintech company if your outcome is positive. Um, no, I don't think so. I, I, I don't really like the term, like, how the term ethical is used. I, like, I, I'm always, like, a little bit, like, icky about people saying, like, uh, we're going to, like, build tech for good or something. It's, like, what, what I really dislike is people's attempts to distance themselves from responsibility. Like, I don't really require people to, like, say that they're doing good. What, what I want is people to stop like bullshitting about what they're actually doing, all right? And actually take responsibility for that. So if you are part of the process of automating the financial sector, you should just say that and then say like, I think it's good because it's going to lower costs, but I'm also aware it's going to do all this other stuff as well. And that's it. Boom. I, I can respect that. Like what I don't respect is the kind of like sort of cliche sort of like language of disruption and like this kind of bullshit around like imagining there's no trade-offs in society. You know, so like that's the kind of like, um, I mean, that's pervasive in the startup world. Is this kind of like sugar-coated sort of like insipid optimism about everything, all right? Like, and, and that's what's one of the main problems about the startup community. It's got, it's just got like fixates upon this like short-term stuff without thinking about the collective consequences. And then denies that they're responsible for the collective consequences and takes personal responsibility for the, for the short-term benefits, all right? This is like a classic Silicon Valley mentality. It's like, I'm a heroic agent. And like, it's up to, it's like, I'm the one who created this, this good, right? But then when there's some like negative thing, it's like, oh no, well, it's just like, this is going to happen anyway. It's like, you know, it's progress. You can't stop it. So there's like weird, like, inability to decide whether you're, you're an active agent or not. All right. Um, and I think people just get, get a bit more real about what's actually going on in the broader sort of economic system. Um, and yes, automation is happening. Um, and it's not actually inevitable. People are able to politically organize to stop things they don't like. Um, so one of the narratives that comes out of the tech sector that this is inevitable. Um, and it's only inevitable under certain circumstances. All right. So like, um, I guess like I, I quite like the title "Conscious FinTech" in a way because it's, it's more about being like, it's like think about stuff, like be conscious. I mean, it's it's like it, it has less of a sort of like cloying kind of like uh, sort of like uh, you know language of like ethics around it. Um, that makes sense. I don't know. I just like ranted rather than answered your question. But like, yeah. Thanks. I think you can. I think you took my question actually without without knowing it. But just one more thing on automation, which you which you said is really at the centre of what's happening in in finance. Um, automation will often be a, a reflection of what is required to be automated. And don't you have any confidence that um, if you're reflecting what is required to be automated, that is in some ways democratic or more democratic than you know you're not in the Lions Club so you don't get a loan or you're you're, not, you're the wrong colour in South Africa and you know. So what is it? Just one more time. What is it about automation, uh, breaking it down a little bit, that you think is inherently dangerous? So you can take that away with us. I don't think it's inherently dangerous, like, like, you probably know from our online debates that, like, I, I come from a more, like, Marxist-orientated perspective. Like, people who, like, think about, who have, like, a market-first perspective often imagine that, like, um, I'm not saying you're doing this, but, like, imagine that, like, what is demanded is, like, the right thing, or, 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 or like, like, Companies act because things are demanded from them. All right. So like, like, so like, therefore, like, any action a corporation is doing is just because it's acting to like what people want. All right. Which is often this like thing that glosses over the power dynamics of what actually happens in markets when you have extremely powerful players who can act with like in sort of 
or as for like hegemonic ways to like alter the sort of culture and like make people want certain things. Um, so if you have like intensely concentrated interests, like financial institutions have intensely concentrated interests and they're well organized, whereas like the public is diffuse and like doesn't have like organization. Like if you think about like where the sort of like the, the, the push for the stuff comes from, doesn't like you don't find people in the streets saying like I demand automation or like I want it. It's more like you slowly like learn that that's what you want through the process of the stuff being like thrown at you and like increasingly put in front of you and like sort of like and so uh, like there's this the power dynamic between like the and the reason why it's, in my perspective like, why companies want to do that of course is that you can cut costs right so I'm I'm operating within that frame of like companies want to cut costs to boost profits rather than they want to find new ways to like serve the demand but like both of these things are at play right like you've got to kind of think about but that, that sort of Answer. So, so we're back to Marxism against capitalism. Is it? So it's the same debate being played out. In, well, not Marxism versus capitalism. It's just like maybe an orientation of like where you think the, the power lies. Yeah, like, I agree. I mean, I, you know, I've been in finance a long time, um, and uh, I think you're really onto something. We have to be conscious of it. But I think we need to, uh, those of us busy people in finance. We need to break it down very clearly. Uh, so the other follow-up question would be whether competition could actually help. I mean. Kind of one more conscious fintech. Is there any benefit from being more conscious than another fintech? But then you might say that I'm oh, introducing. You know, well, you know, the ethical, the, the sort of alternative bank sector that tries to, to do this. Um, but, you know, in the, in the UK, you have attempts to create these sort of like banks that are, um, you know, doing something different. But you're operating against the grain. And you have to really put a lot more effort in because you're already, if you think about that, the public is like primed in certain ways to expect that certain things. Like, I mean, I, I, I don't have enough time to argue this right now, but I, I come from this like, like like analysis of like hegemonic systems, like so like Kramsky and hege hegemony, which is like kind of old school stuff, right? But it's just like ha, like the, the processes by which you engineer consent in society, and if you like structure a society in certain ways, you can actually make people like like choose things, all right? So like if your whole world is structured a certain way, you'll start to like yes, like oh, I want automation. But it's not necessarily like in your interest to have this. Like the real interest at play is the company that's especially like large companies. Like, and I think that's the. I mean, we could discuss hegemony for ages, but uh, getting stuck too much theory. Seven people who want to. I don't know. One, two. Let's say in the gender order tonight, and uh, let's listen to some female voices also before we start. Yeah. So, so, one, two. Three. Who else was showing up? Was you, right? Four or five. Okay, it's fine. Um, fellow South African. Oh, cool. How's it going? <laughs> so, a bit of context there. Um, my question is around um, what your thoughts are around the concept of shared value and the whole micro part of thing and shared how value. bank banks, because I'm working in a bank in South Africa, they're using that as a way to say, okay, already our business model, whether it's around fintech or whatever is we actually are creating value for society anyway, so we don't really need to have a separate sort of conscious okay. um, decision around whether what we're doing is negatively impacting society. <laughs> so I think there might be an issue around the take up of the whole shared value. So can you explain what the shared value thing Okay, is? so it's just that if your business model automatically creates value, as in financial inclusion, um, the negative impacts are sort of not necessarily considered because overall you're actually including more people into the banking okay, system. Yeah. So you're not having a, yeah. a separate um, approach to thinking, okay, so are we financing coal? Are we doing this? Because if we're financing coal in a developing country, ultimately um, there's more electricity provided for people yeah. because they didn't have electricity. So there's a whole... I mean, all, sort all, of like, yeah, a lot of all corporate that activities are... All corporate activities are, are like this, right? They, they produce something that's of, of use. Yeah. But then there's that's like, so yeah, like it's actually, of course, we benefit from electricity and we benefit from many things that, are, that we rely upon. And actually one of the key like ways that like, if, you go, if you do like oil sector campaigning, one of the key things um, around how people justify themselves is like, without us, you won't have electricity, right? So it's like, it's like, the, ma it's, it's like the ethics of maintenance. So it's like we're maintaining systems that you rely upon and therefore we're doing good. Now, a lot of the activist communities, the way they think about it is like, is like, it's like based on like change. So it's like, it's, it's like conceptually like kind of similar to like, 
like an old plumber during the like, like 1800s who's like maintaining lead pipes. And it's like, oh yeah, like without, without me maintaining your lead pipes, like this is, you, you, know, you don't have water. And then people say, yeah, but we should probably not have lead pipes. Can we change the lead pipes? It's something different. And then there's like these guys like resisting that. And like actually like both of these positions are like valid ethical positions. Like fine, you are producing water, but you're also slowly, slowly poisoning people at the same time. And like so, that, and I'm not sure if I'm answering your question entirely, but like yeah, most companies are producing something that's going to be used or that has some kind of thing. But like the question is, are there better ways of doing it? What are the sort of unintended consequences? And I mean, I don't know. I'm already yeah, I'm skirting a bit questions. Both sides have a very strong argument, which makes yeah. it hard for think banks to to change. And yeah. consider all these issues because they say, okay, ultimately we're doing good anyway. <laughs> yeah, but it's, uh, I don't know, it could also be like a cop out position, eh? Yeah. It's like the. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm not sure you put everything in the presentation that you have in the book. Um, oh, oh, it's, oh, it's, it was a paper, not a book. Oh, a book, sorry, a paper. Yeah. Um, so I just want to know basically before I'm going to download the paper and like look for the stuff, whether you are um, mentioning some more constructive things of how to move forward because it's a hacking, um, oh, yeah. hacking the future money. So I was hoping for more kind of more concrete things that are already out there, like um, SRI and S. Oh yeah. yeah. That you haven't really mentioned. And I'm just wondering because you said earlier that, oh, you know, maybe there should be this big, big pause button that should be pressed for people, I can think. And I thought we kind of had that in 2008, wasn't it? And I mean, there's so many like analysts and institutes that are working on SRI. And um, I'm just wondering like where you stand in this debate and how you would answer. Um, I don't know, traditionalist views that say that SRI is basically bullshit investing because it's not, you know, it's kind of a half ass way of investing. It's not really maximizing your financial gains and like wondering why people still have this short funded thinking and not possibly not even know about that SRI and ESG criteria are existing because then they would see, um, I think one of the guys in front said that, you know, financial services, you need a list, but you need to be pragmatic, like give me something that I can work and structure. And I mean, it's there, basically, it's there. There are indicators. You can as well like use them to like create a conscious fintech app for, as far as I'm concerned, you know, you can use SRI criteria, have a positive sure. list, have a negative list of um, where you would want your money to be invested and in do this. Like, I don't know what the yeah, exact this I... is and whether you see this Useful at all because I don't want to be like too critical of you. I mean, I really like you. It can be a good thing. It's like I get critiqued all the time. Important view, but it sounds a bit defeatist to say like all oh, this big system and like you don't even know where to start because people have already started. You know, that's what I like. Sure, sure. When you look at where people have already started and just put your energy there, it's kind of wonderful. I mean, I, I personally get energy out of critique. So like, I know I know that not a lot of people in the entrepreneurial community don't like. Um, so to some extent, there's a, there's a cultural thing, which is like people who come from activist backgrounds like get get a lot of like dynamism from the act of critique. All right, people in like uh, entrepreneur think, uh, sort of circles or like thinking often find that like problematic, or they sort of think that it's somehow like not a good thing. Of course, like, like if you don't have critique, you don't have any idea. Like these these things are like, are like dynamic, dynamic like dynamically interact with each other. Like SRI doesn't exist without the original critiques, right? Like so, um, just yeah, a socially responsible investment. Like so, like yeah, these these are a dynamic interplay. Um, I also find I also think like there's no point being um, uh, if you're going to be optimistic, you have to do it from like a solid basis. Like this, otherwise you're just engaging sort of like faith-based sort of um, like hope, right? You really need like a strong sort of understanding of like so like. But totally, I, I advocate lots of like these um, positive alternatives. Um, but within this, this paper, the objective was um, to talk about the mainstream fintech industry and sort of like general fintech. There are people within the fintech industry who are explicitly thinking about this. But like, you kind of got to like zoom out a bit and think about like the politics of how these industries work. So let me take the example of blockchain technology, which I, I do a lot of work in too. Like, 
one of the things that's been going on in blockchain was like essentially and initially it was like designed as like well you know it's a system to move tokens around the original version right but then like a secondary narrative like a, a, a appeared within the blockchain community about, about how it was going to do like so much good for the world it was going to like help all these like poor people somewhere all right and like that narrative functions to justify many of the normal actions that are going on in that community. Silicon Valley does this too, right? This is a normal business process, and then they create a secondary thing about like tech for good. And, as this, and you, you gotta like see like the politics of how that works. Um, and like be careful not to sort of like inadvertently or do it like uncritically, because I'm totally for like alternatives, but like, yeah, I don't know if the, the point's even clear. Like, like I, I, I do want to like highlight like the power structures that are very, very real, and that's what you're working against. So, like, work, that's the context you're working in. Um, sorry, if that was a bit like vague, that's right. but like um, in my other writing, I talk a lot about like you know positive things. Which you're doing. Yeah. Okay, there's another three questions. Okay, I actually like robots, especially if they. Uh, act like robots instead of people acting like robots. So, um, do you have any idea if we just uh, take it as a granted that everything that can be automated will be automated, what happens afterwards? So post-automation, post-digital, post, post uh, what, what will people do that are just acting like robots now? They say, so, so if everything is automated? Yeah, or almost everything that can be automated will be automated. So the, 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 as long as I can remember, some people were acting like robots. Some jobs were just robotic. Uh, there'll be, I guess, a socialist revolution. <laughs> <laughs> and then we destroy the robots and start all over again. Yeah, well, this is well, this, this is like the, the, the fundamental basis of like most Marxist theory is like the the underlying. And I don't claim to be like I'm, I'm not like some kind of like I, I don't necessarily like always subscribe to this. But like the, the underlying point is. There is an internal profit incentive among companies to automate, all right? But like, for an economic system to work, that doesn't necessarily make sense, right? Because like, as soon as you do that, you potentially undermine the whole structure of like, what enables you to accumulate profit. And I won't go into that, but it's what these call like, the contradictions of, the, of these systems, right? And this is why the whole debate around uh, uh, universal basic income is suddenly springing up in Silicon Valley. Like, it's partly like this awareness that you are undermining the very like way your economic system works by automating. So like within like Marxist theory, they'll say like, well, the natural response is people will take control of the automated systems and they'll they'll take ownership of them from the, the people who currently own them. All right. If you want to prevent that from happening, you can design welfare states. Like that's what the welfare state's about, preventing that from happening. Mm -hmm. All right. So like. Um, yeah, if, if you do like like super far forward like matrix style projections of, of automation, like you're going to have to alter your social social political structure and so on. Otherwise, you're going to have serious problems. And do you have any idea how this should look like? No, I mean, like in, in sort of like uh, I mean, to some extent, it's like it's like kind of like when it's like slightly wanky, like sort of like intellectual futurism questions. People like love to have these debates. In reality, of course, the world probably doesn't like move in this way. People like adapt or create like responses, and it's never like just some like straight trajectory of how this stuff happens, right? But like hypothetically, um, if everything was automated and it was only owned by a small number of people, you would have to have and that's like a kind of like feudalistic. I mean, like cyberpunk fiction predicts this kind of thing. You ever read like cyberpunk? It's like all about like these like giant mega corporations that basically become states, and everybody else like like sits out in the slums and sprawl and sort of like uses old like technology, right? If you want to prevent that, you probably have to think about like I don't know what you're thinking about, but like uh, just I mean some of the decentralization narratives, like you think like like 3D printers and all this kind of stuff. Like one of the stories is that you're going to give people control of essentially like a means of production, such that they're not going to be reliant upon like giant vendors of technology. Um, which would otherwise like, but like this gets too sort of speculative probably for this session right now. We could have like um, a whole other session on that, and maybe you it gets very conceptual. At the bar, have a follow up on that. A very good question. <laughs> um, a few small things. I just found out today in the company I'm working for that someone's job uh, is to, when you sign up for an email list, 
their job is to then manually input your details into the computer. So it's very much automatable. It's a, the very definition of a bullshit job. Similarly, you know, you were saying earlier that people don't want automation. I think in that case, it, you want to put this poor girl out of her misery, you know. Um, and also, people don't like queues. That's some. That's a popular demand for automation in a certain sense. Yeah. Uh, in Germany, they have this incredibly backward system where you have to pay to get money out unless you're at your own bank's branch. So yeah. there are people who are quote unquote disrupting that. Yeah. Um, and you know, I think for good reasons. That when you have a an inefficient system, it's good, it's good to make improvements. What a lot of what people are talking about now is what do we do with the dividends of those improvements? Yeah. Do they do they just go into the Cayman Islands, or do they actually go to improving people's lives? And you can you can talk about how, how to do that in a lot of different ways. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I so when I say people don't want automation, I mean I. It's it's a it's a complex one because I mean like I guess probably like the development of technology has not been like some kind of linear thing. I mean certain things are authentically like save people from strife, but like that like automation in general doesn't necessarily do that. So one it creates like economic contradictions. So like say like Marxist type style of critiques, like political economy style critiques, will be thinking about those things. Like what are the economic contradictions created by it? Then you have like the more like existentialist style of thinking with critiques, which is like, how does it like psychologically change your experience of the world? You know, you might be able to create a perfectly fair system or like it's great, you have to work, all this kind of thing. But then maybe you like lapse into like existential despair because like you no longer feel that you're connected to your environment. You know, like so these are like different like vectors. But like I guess the key problem when we think about this is that like a lot of what businesses work on is short-term convenience. So people do like short-term convenience, especially when you're busy and you're in an already pressured uh, environment and you're kind of precarious. Like short-term convenience, you always can easily sell. What people also like, though, is like long-term texture and engagement with their environment. Like, so if you look at like deeper well-being in society, it's like being able to like really like feel like you're engaging with stuff. So like the the negative side of automation or the positive side might be like you know saving from like some kind of like you know, shitty, like, arduous labor thing. But, like, the, the, the trade-off thing is sometimes around, like, slowly feeling more and more disconnected from your world. Uh, and I, that's, like a, like, a sort of like, a hard thing to... And then never mind the power dynamics of who controls the technology, which is, like, a sort of separate question. Um, so, like, I mean, if you even check it out right now, where people are, like, writing all about, like, the impact of smartphones. Like, and, you know, you have, like, older people, like, complaining a lot about it. But like, one, of the, one of the sort of, like, dynamics of that critique is the idea that, like, people are, like, increasingly, like, losing a sense of, like, what, what reality is. Or, like, increasingly, like, opting for short-term, short-term convenience at the expense of, like, their own inner strength. So it's like, I've forgotten how to, like, navigate because I can automate the map. So, like, I've basically taken something that was inside myself and externalized it. Um, so, anyway, but, like, that's, that's, that's a trade-off. Yeah. Uh, and the other, so I really, really enjoyed the talk really with you up until I think point suggesting number one of the problem, uh, the main problem, ethical problem. The first one you pointed out was that bankers, it would take away the effect of the chance for bankers to use their consciences effectively. Is that really something that happens a lot? Am I being naive there? Or no, it was, it was, it was more that it would, more that it would, it would even further like, potentially like um, allow them to even like. Because right now, bank, yeah, people in financial institutions, and I mean, I used to work in finance, there's, there's lots of like, cool people, but like, they, there are many ways for them currently to justify why certain bad things happen. And the question is, like, is this going to help this, this process to occur even more? Like, like, will it offer like, even more like, ability to distance yourself? Um, actually, I mean, if you read the paper, like, I, I, I do have a cynical thing saying like, it's highly questionable whether like, this is even a thing, but like, totally, it's like... Almost nine o'clock. Okay, yeah, we should, we should like wrap up soon. So yeah. one last question. Yeah, okay, so today about automation of algorithms. Uh, so uh, one problem with algorithms is that, uh, you know, they, it's difficult to contest them, no? Uh, they are perceived as a subjective way of uh, executing decisions and so on, but there's like, uh, they're in, in, in embedded with, uh, with the prejudices and... and, uh, and uh, you know, the ideas of the people who actually 
uh, create them, and sometimes they're even like a, a, a proprietary. So you don't even know how the algorithm works. It's just a black box that there is no transparency around it. So like that can be uh, especially like here in the case, for instance, of great score and stuff like that. You know that uh, you know basically you cannot confess all this because uh, you know there is like this idea that this is gonna they might be absolutely impartial, you know, where it's not, no? Uh -huh. Yeah, sure. No, I mean, and this, this, this goes beyond finance as well. There's like the, the realm of like AI ethics and data ethics is like applied to all industries now. Um, and as we sort of like alluded to earlier, it's, it's not like you don't want to romanticize like the sort of original human processes necessarily, but like you don't simultaneously want to romanticize the, the algorithmic processes. Um, yeah, um, there is like a, like a whole bunch of groups who are currently doing like sort of targeted research on the ethics of um, uh, algorithms. I saw like a really interesting group recently, which is like their, their name I've forgotten now, but it's a whole institute that's been set up now to think about like the deeper sort of questions, you know. Um, you know it includes like the sort of like bias stuff, it includes like the surveillance implications, it includes like many different things that are going on with these, these systems. Mm -hmm. Um, the lack of accountability. Um, so yeah, it's like an ongoing field. Um, and actually, you know, Berlin's one of the places I'd say, like, which has one of the strongest communities around sort of thinking critically about technology. Um, London actually is like comparatively like far behind. Like, there's like only like one or two spaces in London that actually do it. Um, whereas here, it's like there's a much stronger community. In the states, there's like a few people who are thinking about it, like a few research institutes. But it's um, yeah. The Finance Innovation Lab, which I'm part of, has got a whole program running now too, which is like about thinking about, okay, this is going to happen, like let's think about how we influence the processes now um, sort of on, on AI systems. Yeah. So, <laughs> take a deep breath.